feminists talking about how the state should have no role in a woman's decision over whether she can abort her unborn child. The fact that the state can decide that a man has to go to war to, to kill others and to risk his own life, that is the most absolute kind of power an entity can have over a person's body, obviously. Just because women didn't have the right to vote doesn't mean they had no voice. When they were talking about their disabilities, they often referred to themselves as slaves. They used that phrase, the enslavement of women in marriage, over and over again. I mean, this is astounding to me that living at a time when slavery actually existed, when they knew about it, they were even involved in the anti-slavery movement, so obviously cared about the injustices to enslaved persons, yet they could refer to themselves in all of their privileged position as equivalently oppressed. Hi, Janice. Hello, Tammy. How are you? Good. Good to see you again. Great to see you. We've been having uh, a lot of really good comments from the previous uh, podcast that we did on Victoria Woodhull. So I'm very much looking forward to today talking about uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton with you. Uh, Me too. Yes. And uh, I did a lot of reading through the Women's Bible until I, well, until I realized just what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And so then I didn't have to read any longer. Right. <laughs> yes, you don't need to read to the end. <laughs> no, you don't have to. And it's a good thing because it's a very thick book. In fact, mm -hmm. it's just really a transcript of the Bible with her commentary through yes. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, let, uh, I think what we should start out with is we did decide to talk about Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I'd like mm -hmm. to talk about her, uh, where she's from, when she lived, what her childhood was like, uh, and then what her work was like, if that is good for you. Okay. That's great for me. Yes, she okay. is a very interesting person. She was born in 1815 and lived till 1902. So her life pretty much spanned the 19th century, and she was probably the most important leader of the organized women's movement in the United States. She and Susan B. Anthony, a close friend of hers, you know, with, with whom she worked, those two are the names most associated with feminism in the 19th century. And, um, so, and she, you know, she founded, she wrote the um, most important foundational document of the women's movement that we can touch on a little bit. It's a fascinating document called the Declaration of Sentiments. And uh, that was relatively early in her life and career. She also wrote the Woman's Bible, as you say, this um a series of passages from the Bible with, with commentary, mostly by Stanton herself, but also by uh, some other feminist leaders from different countries. And she was the most energetic campaigner um, for women's issues throughout the latter half of the 19th century. She was very active in the suffrage movement. That was her primary aim uh, to uh, have women uh, achieve the right to vote. And I'd like to talk about that because that's a fascinating issue. And um, But she was also active in lots of other women's issues as well. She was uh, involved in liberalizing divorce law. She was interested in changing the law uh, affecting crimes committed by women. She was involved in some very high profile cases of infanticide, arguing that women should not be held to a um, serious standard of murder for cases in which they killed their children. Um, she was also, of course, very interested in, in uh, reforming the reception of the Bible. And even uh, she even advocated changing the wording of the Bible to reflect a um, you know, more liberal view of, of women's position in society. So, that's, that's quite interesting too. And she, um, a little bit about her childhood. She, she had a, um, I think quite typical upper middle class upbringing. 
And in that way, she was representative of many uh, leaders in the women's movement. She was born in Johnstown, New York State, and she lived most of her life in New York, uh, in Seneca Falls and around there, although she spent some time in Boston as well. She had um, a very privileged upbringing. Her father was a wealthy landowner and a judge, and he gave his daughter the best education that she could have. She attended a school called the Troy Seminary, and it was established in the early 19th century in order to give women an education in the arts, sciences, and mathematics equivalent to what men would receive if they went to college. So she had an you know, excellent upbringing and, and education. She, despite all of that, she um, very early on seems to have developed a deep sense of anger at her exclusion as a woman from certain spheres of endeavor. Was it, was it true that her brother died when he was quite young? Or 20, he was 20, right? Yeah, her brother died. He was about 10 years older than her. I, I think I read that he was 21, but mm -hmm. I might mm -hmm. have that wrong. But it, anyway, around that age. And he was expected to follow in his father's footsteps, uh, you know, to go into law, perhaps to become a judge, that sort of thing, and, and to enter into politics as well. And her father was has said to have been heartbroken when he died. And the legend is that he said at some point to Elizabeth after her brother's death, she was about 11 at this time, he said to have said to her, I wish you had been born a boy. And that has been um, used as an example of the Stanton's strong sense of marginalization as a, as a female child, uh, that she couldn't do the things that her father expected her brother to have done. In fact, of course, she did a lot of things and um, uh, probably became much more famous, traveled more widely, um, met more people and affected her society much more than she would have done if she had been a male child who had gone into law. But uh, so, so there it is. Yeah, she, um, she was, um, you know, she knew all of the major figures in the social reform movement in the United States and elsewhere. She traveled widely uh, on her honeymoon. She went with her husband, <clears throat> who also became a lawyer, uh, and he was an abolitionist. He was involved in the movement to abolish slavery. And so when she married him on their honeymoon, they went to London to attend a conference on the abolition of slavery. She became very close friends with many men and women in that movement, uh, many of whom were um, dissident Christians, uh, Quakers often, who believed very strongly in egalitarianism, both between the races and between the sexes. And she became close friends with a woman named Lucretia Mott, a Quaker activist who was about 22 years older than Stanton, but really encouraged Stanton to, um, you know, to think deeply about her disabilities and the discrimination that she experienced as a woman and to advocate for women's cause. So um, when she returned from her honeymoon, she became active almost immediately. Um, she married in 1840 when she was 25, and in 1841, she gave her first speech on women's issues. Uh, there's a, in one of the biographies I read, uh, there's a quotation from a letter that she wrote to a friend saying that she was so eloquent during this speech that she brought not only her audience but herself to tears. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I thought that was delightful. I mean, I admire her for feeling so good about herself at such a young age, uh, you know, giving a speech on this topic. I think it does tell us something about, um, one, the fact that whatever she might have said about her uh, sense of injury, uh, having been raised female, it obviously didn't do anything to dampen her self-confidence or her, you know, her, her ability to encounter the world and to raise her voice and to make her presence known. Um, the fact that she talked about causing 
like bringing herself to tears just makes me think that this was a woman who enjoyed um, being in the limelight and even enjoyed performing her own, uh, you know, victimhood or performing her own advocacy. So this was a woman really fired up um, by a sense of injustice, but I think also to a large extent reveling in that sense of injustice. Yeah, performance is a good, you said performing, and I think, yes, yeah. that sounds like there was some performance. That was her throughout her life. She was, everything was, was as I'm sure you found when you were reading the woman's Bible, everything is filtered through this lens of grievance and even bitter anger. She was, we'll talk about the book later, but she was um, so adamant about her belief that the woman's cause was really the, the major and even for her, the only cause that really mattered, that she allowed it to destroy friendships. Um, she was very close friends with uh, an editor on, in a new, on a New York newspaper near, named Horace Greeley. She broke with him completely because although he had been a supporter of woman suffrage, he felt at one point that it wasn't a practical reform for the Republican Party to be pursuing at a certain stage in American history. She broke with him completely. Um, you know, friendships were lost as a result. I think it harmed her marriage. Uh, as time went on, she spent less and less time in the company of her husband. She wasn't with him when she died. When he died in 1887, um, she seems to have expressed very little grief over his passing. And um, yeah, it, that you know, it it was the ruling passion of her life to the exclusion of everything else. And um, uh, she was quite adamant that that that's how she wanted to live her life. There are many letters in which she wrote to Susan B. Anthony talking about the friendships that they had lost and even the uh, splitting apart of the woman's suffrage movement over the issue of whether black men should be given the right to vote before women. And uh, she was quite, um, she, she I, as far as I know, she never expressed regret that her adamancy caused all of these various uh, losses and um, rifts with with friends and associates. Yeah, well, I think, you know, when when your motivations come from bitterness and resentment, it colors everything. It colors your uh, your outlook and what you see, uh, what you hear, what you're thinking. It's, it's pretty, well, what do they say? They you know, psych psychologists say that resentment is one of the things that can re that can end your life. It can kill you. So it's it's a very nasty way to live. It's destructive. It's destructive. It's 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 not uh, resentment is n nothing that you wish upon someone to to have that. So uh, it's unfortunate. And, and her husband, I imagine, he was a busy guy. Uh, he may have not known what to do with her how to help her. Yes. Well, I can imagine that um, she made his life or she made their life together quite uncomfortable. And there is a letter in which she responds to the inquiry of a friend about their relationship as husband and wife. And she admits that his views were much more conventional than hers were. He, he, I mean, he wasn't, um, opposed to the issues that she was concerned about. And in fact, he had, as I said, introduced her to the abolition movement. He had many friends in the anti-slavery movement. So he was a man who was very deeply concerned about social injustice. Mm -hmm. He was not a radical feminist. Clearly, he married a woman who was uh, brilliant, very well educated, very headstrong. He would have known all of those things when he married her. So he wasn't opposed to the idea of having a woman uh, as a partner who was very um, her own person. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he was the kind of really quite radical feminist that she was. 
when we get to talking about the declaration of sentiments, it becomes apparent right from the very beginning of that document, which she mostly wrote you know, with some help from friends, but it was mostly her, her uh, wording. It becomes obvious there that she is not only asserting the, that the time has come for women to take a greater share in social responsibilities, let's say, which is one of the ways that the women's movement could have been framed. Women could have said, it's now time. Um, the um, social context allows us to be much more active in our society than we have been before this. And we would like to take a greater share of the burdens of building this country and, and making our society better. That would be one way to put it. Mm -hmm. But it the document does not frame the women's demands in that way at all. It frames them at entirely in the context of bitter anger and a sense of massive and unalloyed grievance that all the history of mankind has been has been the history of men oppressing women. It says that right out. And yeah, we should read. We should read just a little bit. Let's. Because yeah, I don't. I don't sure. know that. Yeah, I don't know that people know this. I didn't no, know this document. I, well, I didn't either until um, you know maybe four years ago. I was already quite involved at that point in um, anti-feminist kind of advocacy and and pro uh, men's issues advocacy. And somebody finally told me about it, and I was shocked. So what year was how, that when you find it? How long ago was that when oh, you found I it? Oh, I probably, I heard about it probably in about 2015. I didn't oh, seriously okay. read it until just a few years ago. I'd say I read it I through yeah. in about 2018 or 2019. And I Isn't was, that strange though, that somebody yes. as prominent as her with something of this description wasn't widely taught in women's studies? Mm -hmm. yes, You'd think that I, that I would have been a document, but it wasn't. Well, I, I never heard of it. Of course, my focus was more on British and Canadian women's history, but mm. still I would have expected I would have known about it when I was doing my PhD on, on women's writing. And it is surprising to me how little known it is generally today amongst people who are interested in gender issues. And it is a document that everybody should read because it is so remarkably angry, sweeping in its condemnation. And as we'll see when we look at it, actually false in many of its representations of the status mm -hmm. of women in their contemporary society. And so I always think of it, um, you know, when I think of Stanton, who she was, who her friends were, her marriage, I think of, imagine being married to a woman who believed that the whole history of mankind is the history of men oppressing women. There's not a single good word said about any man in that document Unbelievable. Yeah, how, how could you be that husband? Uh, well, you'd work late a lot, I think. You'd work, you did, work and he late. Did. He traveled, you know, he traveled. He was away from their home uh, for months at a time. And uh, I can't help but think that uh, that had something to do with the fact that she was so angry about what she believed men had done to women. And the other really um, fascinating thing about the document uh, is that men actually signed that document. Yes, I saw there was a list, a long list of women, and then a long list of men. Mm -hmm. So yes. uh, yeah, I was, but there are plenty of male feminists now. There That's certainly for sure. are. I wouldn't yeah. have thought that there would have been so many then. Uh -huh. um, but and it, it again, I think, um, certainly raises the question of what kind of patriarchy it, you know, allegedly existed at the time that Stanton was first organizing the women's movement, if so many men would come to a convention, probably the first convention on women's rights in the United States, it was held in Seneca Falls, New York, and um, how many men would come to a convention like that, sit quietly and, and listen to this sweeping condemnation of their entire sex without a single word about any of the good men had ever done as providers for women, as protectors mm -hmm. for women, as people who sacrificed their lives in war, uh, as, as the, the sex that largely built the prosperous and relatively secure society in which these women were living that enabled them to stand up in a well-lit and well-built 
hall and and a warm maybe, hall yeah. yeah i mean i think it was in the summer so i was going to say warm but oh. yeah probably warm well, anyway, maybe but, cool <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i don't know if they had air conditioning but i don't you know, know either they're, they're, well they had they fans <laughs> yeah something <laughs> Uh, you know, so there they were, um, enabled to do um, all of this advocacy with not only with the support of men and within the civilization that men had built, but even with the approval of men to launch these thundering denunciations from their pulpits uh, and to have men sign that document, including a very famous orator, the escaped slave and abolitionist leader, Frederick Douglass. He signed the document. Well, that's the thing about men, right? They, th I think men, they listen. They're used to listening to each other to find out whether other men have good ideas or not, because mm -hmm. it is up to each of us to uh, try to bring things to the right place. And so they're, you, they were used to that social, uh, negotiation and hierarchy that had to be figured out who would be on top mm -hmm. and who wouldn't be on top. And so they were giving the benefit of the doubt to women mm -hmm. to see if maybe this is what they were doing. Turned out yeah. that isn't what they were doing, that that isn't part of our history, that, that vying for position in the hierarchy. That's a, that's something men have done for, centuries since the beginning yeah and mm -hmm. and we've been in the home and in our small communities that was our sphere of status and influence and all of a sudden it was like oh women want to be in our sphere let's see what they have to offer so mm -hmm. they were yeah generously listening now yes. i don't know about the people that signed that document i don't know if that came out of generosity or or if they were feeling the same if they were feeling some self-loathing so that mm -hmm. they would sign it. I, I don't know. Yes, I know. I, I, I don't know either. I mean, you know, there's certainly a whole book to be written just about that document. And uh, yeah. I, there have been books books written about it. And, and I want to read even more widely about it because that was one of the things I thought when, you know, you mentioned self-loathing and generosity. And I think um, it's hard not to think that it was some combination of those two things. There, there had to have been love in the hearts of many of the men who attended that convention and signed that document because they did believe that women deserved a larger role in right. the wider society. And they seem, many of them did believe that women would bring um, perhaps a better or a different perspective, maybe even mm -hmm. as it was often said in the 19th century, that women would bring a purifying influence the the idea that women are the more moral sex uh that women are naturally um more empathetic more caring uh have a heightened understanding of the needs of children you know all of those things whether they're exactly true or not um were widely believed in the 19th century. Sometimes that was actually used as the reason why women shouldn't be involved in politics, precisely because their qualities and attributes were those best suited for other types of, um, you know, caring other spheres. Um, but, but certainly it was widely believed that women could potentially bring a purifying influence to public life. And so perhaps that was part of what was animating some of those men. Also, perhaps some of the men believed the denunciations and did have self-hatred, guilt, self-loathing. And, you know, reading that, and I thought, wow, the, all those men, 32 men, I think is the number that signed that document in, in addition to about 68 women, if I counted correctly. And, and, uh, I don't know. I, I can't imagine women signing a document saying that they're in the whole history of humankind, women had done nothing but bad. And, and, and so it, it, it's startling to me that any man could sign that. And it made me think that there is a history of, of psychological abuse or perhaps um, accepted guilt and, and self-loathing that goes back at least to 1848 and may go back even further. Well, you know, a sign of conscientiousness is questioning. If somebody says you've done something wrong, it, a conscientious person will scour their life to find out maybe if they have done something wrong. It's possible that even just on the off chance that they were, they were 
in some way stopping women from being who they needed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, they would give that a, ch a, a chance to be aired in public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to see, and they probably had faith that it would, the outcome would be, the outcome would, would be known. But when will the outcome be known? This could, you know, maybe they thought the outcome would be known in a year or two, but it turns out that the outcome might be centuries later because you, you just don't know. <laughs> and, and I think that is a good point, too, that, that, um, that part of what those men were, some of them anyway, must have been feeling was, uh, yeah, just a, a generous willingness to give women a chance and to demonstrate yeah. the kind of fair-mindedness that um, was being demanded of them, although at the same time um, was, was uh, part of what the women were claiming they didn't have. But yeah, let's, let's look at a, a, some of the yes, statements. Let's, it's, please do. It's not a super long document. We won't want no, to. No, it isn't. It's, I was surprised. You said, let's read, read this, Tammy. And so I went to read it and it's very short. It's quite short. Yeah. And I would really, encourage everybody to take a look well i think we could always um afterwards we can maybe put it as a link on the on the podcast so that people can read it mm -hmm. yeah it, it's it's not a long not it's not like the woman's bible it's worth reading for sure yeah so i mean it, it basically it it is designed it's called the declaration of sentiments it was issued in 1848 at seneca falls and it, it has it models itself uh, generally on the Declaration of Independence. You know, it has some of that language at the at the very beginning. Now, some mm -hmm. people have noted too, just before we start in looking at it, some people have noted that 1848 was also the year that the Communist Manifesto was issued. Oh. So that's kind of interesting. It people is. have wondered, you know, did Stanton know of the Communist Manifesto? Certainly the language of the Declaration of Sentiments is really focused on women being oppressed on all sides. So some of that Marxian revolutionary language um, about the, you know, the oppression of a class is is here in the Declaration mm -hmm. of Sentiments. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, having said that, I'm not sure whether she had read it, the uh, Communist Manifesto was published in German initially, and it wasn't translated into English until 1850. And in fact, it wasn't widely available in the United States until some decades later. So, you know, I'm not sure. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, revolutionary fervor was in the air in 1848. Right. This was the mm -hmm. time of revolutions all across Europe. And, and it's highly likely that Stanton and her friends knew about the Communist Manifesto and knew at least generally what, you know, what it was about. So, mm -hmm. so I, I picked out some of the major oh, statements in the Declaration of, of Sentiments that I thought we could go through that to me, what the, the thesis statement, you know, the, the key sentence that sums up the whole document is when they say, or she says, it's, it's a primarily Stanton who wrote it. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. That's the thesis statement. So we, you can't get more sweeping than that. No. <laughs> She's, they're not saying... Uh, the laws of this country are uh, unjust to women, which would be an argument you could you could make. They're not saying uh, women, um, you know, are excluded from certain realms of public life that they should be included in. No, it's the whole history of mankind is the history of repeated injuries and usurpations, and the yeah. whole point of it is the establishment of an absolute tyranny. Wow, that is a very sweeping condemnation. So then it, it says, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. I think that's very interesting. Let facts be submitted. And so the first thing I want to know as I go through reading these various statements in support of that thesis is, are these actually true? And how do I know that they are true? And in fact, when one researches turns out that the reality of history is a lot more complicated than Stanton and her allies claimed. But let's look at some of them. The first one, 
he has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. So he's never allowed her to vote. Yeah, right. So that's that's that that was the big one for her. Mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, living uh, in a, in a house with a judge for a father who also mm -hmm. taught lawyers about the law. She was outraged at the fact that she was excluded from the right to vote. Um, there's quite a few things to be said about the right to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the most salient probably is that it isn't true that all men living in the United States or across the English speaking world had the mm -hmm. right to vote. Mm -hmm. That's right. And she must have known that. And so well, I she had very... she had men in her house. She had helpers in her house that were black, right? And they never had they never had had the vote. No. She knew that. She knew that for sure. She knew that. So she's excluding them, um, but not making that clear. And and even poor white men in the United States didn't necessarily mm. have the right to vote. Um, voting qualifications varied from state to state, but often involved some kind of property or income qualification. Um, so mm. there were men in the United States, white men in the United States who didn't have the right to vote in 1848 when she penned this sweeping condemnation. So she's blaming all men for excluding women when in fact some men were excluded. And the thing about voting, um, you know, I'm not an expert on, on, on the history of, of suffrage, but before the 19th century and even into the 19th century, voting was not understood to be a right of every citizen. It was uh, understood to be a privilege that was granted to certain citizens. And with that privilege came specific obligations and burdens. Right. Good idea. And, and that's what she also must have known. She was not a stupid woman mm -hmm. uh, but, and somehow didn't care. Uh, the most obvious burden and obligation that came with the right to vote was the burden to be willing and have no choice in the matter of in serving one's country at time of war. Mm -hmm. And that has always been the burden of men. And it has never been the burden of women. Of course, women have other burdens, but it is not that one. And so you know, it was often understood that the ballot was a kind of substitute for, for bullets. And that ultimately, if political issues, issues relating both to national affairs and to international affairs, if those could not be resolved through the regular processes of consultation and voting, etc., that the result would be that those same people who were charged with determining the future of their country might have to go to war to defend right. their country. They might have mm -hmm. to risk their lives. They might have to kill and be killed. This is the reality of male citizenship from the earliest times to the present. I mean, it's still the reality in the United States well, and indeed in, in Canada and elsewhere, specifically in the United States through the selective service system young men still have to sign on to the selective service system, which means that if there is a war and if there has to be a draft, their names are on a list and they can be called up. Women do not have to sign on to the selective service system. You can't decide not to. You can't say, oh, well, I'm not interested. If you refuse to sign on, um, you're basically excluded from life in your society. You can't get a driver's license. You can't apply for, um, I think, you know, various types of insurance. Like you're, you're absolutely excluded as a male. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that. No, I mean, I didn't know that either, you know, and, and that the selective service system wasn't actually established until the very early 20th century, but mm -hmm. she would have known obviously that that is the, the reality for, for life for male citizens that in a right. way men, men's bodies 
are owned by the state Hmm. in a way that women's bodies are not owned by the state. Mm -hmm. And so all of the discussion, you know, and it's one of the things that is so irritating um, to me when I hear, and and to many other people too, when we hear, um, you know, angry feminists talking about how the state should have no role in a woman's decision over whether, you know, when and whether she can abort her unborn child, things like that. Uh, the fact that the state can decide that a man has to go to war to to kill others and to risk his own life to potentially be maimed or killed, that is the most absolute kind of power an entity can have over a person's body, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, you know, and that, that very rarely gets talked about in discussions about voting rights. And women did, of course, eventually get the right to vote. Stanton didn't live to see it, but they did. Mm-hmm. And, and they never had to risk their lives in war in, in exchange for that, that right. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it, that's not really equality. That's, that's something else. And there's a deep dishonesty, I think, in this document and in discussions about voting rights generally on that point. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, I, you know, just, just generally, um, I think when, when all of us now look back on the 19th century and on the uh, issue of voting, the idea is that this was something women had to fight for and you know it was an inarguable injustice right. that they didn't have the right to vote. I felt that. I remember one of the first interviews I ever gave, um, somebody said, well, you know, did the women's movement get anything absolutely right? And I said, oh, well, the right to vote, of course, that was, that was a terrible mm-hmm. injustice. But, you know, it was a much more, when you really go back and look at the debates about it, it was a much more complex issue. And it, and it was mm-hmm. never the fact that, uh, as as feminists tended to express and still imply now, it was never the fact that, that those who didn't want women to vote hated women or thought they were stupid. It wasn't that. I mean, there were mm-hmm. some people who thought women didn't know enough to be um, well-informed voters, that's certainly true. Women themselves often said that women as a group were not as well-informed as men about issues pertaining to especially federal franchises. Um, you know, but it, it was often just the idea that, that women had a separate sphere and that that sphere, that they did best and society worked best when women put their energies and attentions into that sphere. And we can object to that and say, you know, that that was wrong or a prejudiced, bigoted attitude. But it was the idea that women did best when they, they looked after home affairs. That was their realm. And they were certainly not excluded entirely from the larger society. Women were respected and encouraged as business owners, uh, as charity workers, as healers, as advisors. They always, or for many, many years prior to to, uh, Stanton's writing this document, they did have the right to vote in municipal you know, in local mm-hmm. elections, women mm-hmm. always voted like in school board elections and things like that. Mm-hmm. And very shortly after she wrote this document, many states enfranchised women as well. They didn't have the federal right to vote until 1920. But, you know, I this see. idea that they were excluded and it was such an obvious injustice is simply not true. And one last thing about that point, I know I'm going on about it, but it, I, I find it fascinating Um, One last point was that um, some people argued, including women, a lot of women were were opposed to the Mm -hmm. extension of the franchise to women. Mm -hmm. Some people argued that women were actually more effective as advocates when they weren't actually voters. Mm -hmm. Um, It Mm -hmm. gave them a It's kind of like Switzerland or or Austria. Austria had the neutral vote, yeah. Mm -hmm. It it was exactly that. Like it, it was that they could... Could, it wasn't that they couldn't, you know, advocate for issues that they were concerned about. And they had great moral authority in advocating for those things, things that had to do with children, things that had specifically to do with women. Women advocated for uh, the extension of their 
um, right to attend higher education. They advocated for changes to married women's rights. They, they, they were involved in all sorts of issues before they had the franchise and men listened to them because the men were married to those women and they had daughters and they had mothers and they loved women. So, mm -hmm. And the fact that they didn't necessarily belong to a political party and that they didn't have the vote didn't mean that they didn't have power. And that, that, and in fact, as I say, some people argue it gave them a different kind of power and allowed I, them to involve themselves in a different way. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. what I'm thinking right now about that is how are families doing now? How mm -hmm. is marriage doing now? Yeah. How is the home doing now? How mm -hmm. many people eat their breakfast, lunch, and dinner all together? Yeah. You know, how many mothers are home with their children? How many children do mothers have now? How many people are married? You know, it's just, yeah. and that was our sphere of uh, competence. That yeah. was our sphere of competence. But we want, but there was a drive to be, we want this, we want this federal vote. And possibly, I don't know, but it looks like in order to, in order to go into the sphere where men are, they have, Women have had to in there wasn't an it wasn't uh they're not an, they can't have both rules mm -hmm. it's not possible, so they're going to end up one rule is going to end up being uh completely ignored mm -hmm. or left to squand in squander mm -hmm. yeah so it's very this is very interesting i, I you know i don't I'm only hearing this for the first time, so I'm only starting to to think about it. But I can see now with this change in the, in the vote and how things have changed in society for the families. And well, it's complicated. This is one aspect, but it's right. still a, a, an incredible change. It's an incredible mm -hmm. change. It is, and and um, you know some of the you know that that was one of the issues that. Uh, anti-suffragists, as they were called, those who were opposed to extending the franchise, was one of the arguments they made, that it would weaken the home inevitably. Mm -hmm. And they were laughed mm -hmm. at for saying that. Um, mm -hmm. One of the women I uh, studied in, when I was writing my PhD, Nellie McClung, a Canadian feminist, she you know, had great fun with that idea that it would ruin the home if she just happened oh, to go geez. out you know, once every four years, if she went out to, to vote. Uh, that, you know, that, that right. she'd still managed to make the dinner, even on those days when, you know, once out of four years when she went to vote. So she ridiculed the idea. But of course, what they were referring to was a much larger social shift that we have now seen over the 20th century and into the 21st century. And it is a very significant one. And, and um, you know, and, and there were other concerns as well. Uh, you know, some people said, well, women do tend to vote with their, or, or they, they, they tend to feel uh, and, and be guided by their feelings more than men. And so is mm -hmm. that necessarily going to lead to the best decisions made uh, about election, uh, you know, electing leaders and that sort of thing? There was a concern that women would vote based on their, um, you know, how they felt about the person. Or how they looked or appearances because women, women uh, look at each other. We have a lot more um, interest in uh, visual appearance and, and we look at each other, all of us women, we look at each other and, and we have some sort of, uh, there's always a, a vying. Let's see now is it, is that, is what she did with her hair? you know, a better style, like, would that be better for me? Or am I doing better than her so that I, I'm, you know, I've got the upper hand. And so now when we look at our political leaders, is that how we're going to, I'm wondering in Canada, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, we have a political mm -hmm. leader in the federal government who's Looks got good. nice hair <laughs> yes. and lovely mm -hmm. socks. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes. And so, and we, the women, I think it was, Practically 70% 70, 70 of women still want to vote for, for uh, Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was one of the concerns that rather than make decisions based on the knowledge of political issues, which women still are not as interested in any survey that's done of uh, what women read in the newspapers or most of mm -hmm. us read online now, um, there is a large gap between um, men's and women's interest in political and international and economic issues. Women do tend to be more interested in, uh, in stories. Um, they're interested in personalities. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the woman's thing. And so that does translate into a different kind of emphasis at the voting booth. And that this yes. is one of the things that people worried about. And of course, the, very, the highly intelligent women who were at the forefront of the suffrage movement poo-pooed it and said, nonsense, women are, will educate themselves, women can you know, be just as intelligent as men, which is true. But they, they denied that there are these sort of overall tendencies that uh, don't necessarily lead to um, the most practical and well-grounded political decisions. So yes. anyway, yes. That, that, yeah, so there's that too. But so let's go on and we'll look at a few others. Um, it goes on uh, talking about law and, and um, uh, representation again, uh, it says of man, he has withheld from her, no, sorry, one before that, he has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. Now, I'm not sure what that means uh, exactly. Um, well, uh, allegedly, again, that, that women couldn't vote, therefore the, the laws were formed without their, their uh, right to, to represent themselves. Now, right. that's not quite true in the sense that just because women didn't have the right to vote doesn't mean they had no voice. So again, she's oversimplifying. The, the implication there would be that men did never, did not take into account women's needs when they were forming laws or voting. And that is simply not true. Men had, as I said, they had wives, they had children, they had daughters that they loved very much. They wanted a society that would be the best for the women in their lives. So women were represented by the men in their families or by their close friends or their husbands. So this notion that simply because one didn't have a vote, one therefore had no voice in the formation of one's nation's laws is a bit of an oversimplification. Then she goes on, he is withheld from her rights are, which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that meant exactly, I guess just generally, that those de degraded uh, men could, could vote. She's still talking about that. Then she goes on, having deprived her of this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation. Again, as I say, that's uh, not quite correct. He has oppressed her on all sides. So now, now the condemnation broadens out. He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. Now, that's yeah. an interesting Jesus. thing to say. Now, there's, this is not without basis. It is true that English law saw man and wife as one person in the mm -hmm. law and that that person tended to be um, subsumed under the, the legal entity of the husband. So mm -hmm, to that mm -hmm. extent, what she's saying is correct. But again, it's such a complex issue and it isn't clear that women always had um, the wrong end of the stick to speak colloquially in marriage. I mean, marriage was understood very differently in the 19th century from how it is now. It was, it was um, the, the law then was the law of coverture it meant that women gave up certain rights when they became married. They gave up their right to sexual autonomy. They, they were um, understood to consent to their husband's um, sexual advance, which is not to say that there wasn't widespread understanding that no man should force a woman. But... Um, the, the idea was that the woman was to owe her fidelity, sexual and emotional, to her husband so that he would know that 
the children that she bore were his mm -hmm. children. And that, that's what it was all about. It was about protecting children, um, protecting the rights of the father and the family. But the man also gave up autonomy. He gave up mm -hmm. his financial autonomy. Everything he had, he had to give to his wife to support her. Even in cases where there's a very interesting um, 19th century barrister and uh, journalist named E. Belfort Bax, who's written about this quite extensively, he felt that men were the ones who were subjugated in marriage because he felt that the laws largely favored women. And he gave cases of um, women who uh, left their husbands, um, went to live somewhere else, yet still demanded that their husbands support them financially. A man was liable for his wife's debts. He had to pay all her debts or he could go to debtor's prison if he couldn't pay her debts. So he had a very big financial responsibility. Well, it's it's very similar now in, in a divorce court. You know, men men can be taken for, they, they can have their passport taken. They can have their driver's license taken. They can have their bank account taken. I mean, <laughs> It's, it hasn't gotten any better, for, no, I would it, say. It, in many, well, it's gotten worse in the sense that the yeah. obligations and duties that were imposed on the wife have all been lifted because they're seen as unjust, but the obligations and burdens imposed on the husband continue. And now, of course, even if the um, woman divorces the man and he doesn't want the divorce, um, it doesn't make any difference. He still has to pay for her support and that of the children that he may not even be allowed to see depending on whether she wants him to see them or not. So, yes, yes I mean, the, right. the, and you know, and this has always been the case and, and that's what's being left out of, of Stanton's statement is that there has always been this kind of um, absolute um, financial obligation on the part of the man who, who knows how many men went to debtors prisons because they mm -hmm. couldn't pay their wife's debts. There were many um, types of crimes that a man could commit against his wife and that he could be prosecuted for. Uh, you know, even things like um, a, um, defamation. If he spoke against his wife in public, mm -hmm. he could be prosecuted for defamation. No matter what the wife said about the husband, mm -hmm. she could mm -hmm. not be prosecuted. There were many crimes for which women were um, just exempt from any kind of prosecution or, or punishment. So, so yes, there were limitations on women as a result of, of their entry into the state of marriage, but there were also on men as well. And, and she's not mentioning yes. that. So, so, right. you know, that, that's something else. It, it goes on. He has taken from her all right in property, even to the wages she earns. Okay, again, this is not um, completely untrue, but it is not the whole story either. It is true that when a woman married, her property went into the uh, under the control of the husband. And there, mm -hmm. all, this is a really complicated legal issue. Sometimes there was like a separate, like her property would still be separate from her husband's, but he had control over it, um, that she couldn't sell it without his signature on the deed you know there are all sorts of laws around the control of property but those were in the process of being amended even while she was writing this starting in the 1830s various states mm -hmm. began to enact married woman's property law rights and and you can mm -hmm. you know research the with the states that engaged in this and new york state itself was working on a married woman's property act in the very year that she wrote this 1848 and she knew this because she was involved in the drafting of the new law that would give women much more independent control over any property that they had that they brought into the marriage or over any earnings that they made uh, you know as a result of a business or, or whatever they were involved in so there had been these disabilities for women. They were being re removed. And throughout the 19th century, they were all removed as a result of women's advocacy. Mm -hmm. And she knew this. So this was not really true. And um, uh, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's another one that's, that's not quite accurate. And then goes on, he has made her morally an irresponsible being as she can commit many crimes with impunity 
provided they be done in the presence of her husband. I don't know about that last clause, but this is a very strange thing to complain about as an example of patriarchal oppression is that women could commit many crimes with impunity when, <laughs> under the, the uh, you know, sanctity of their marriage uh, and that they weren't held responsible for their own crimes. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that doesn't sound like, uh, you know, slave status to me. Uh, and, and that is a, a point, actually, that, that these women, uh, when they were talking about their disabilities, they often referred to themselves as slaves. They used that mm. phrase, the enslavement of women huh. in marriage, over and over again. I mean, this is astounding to me that living at a time when slavery actually existed, when mm -hmm. they knew about it, they were even involved in the anti-slavery movement, so obviously mm -hmm. cared about the injustices to enslaved persons. Mm -hmm. Yet they could refer to themselves in all of their privileged position as equivalently oppressed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it just says something about um, the lack of uh, honesty or, or self-awareness yeah. uh, that they were showing. Uh, so going on, after depriving her of all rights as a married woman, if single and the owner of property, he has taxed her to support a government which recognizes her only when her property can be made profitable to it. Well, okay, so what? Yeah, when they were single, they could own their own property and they had to pay taxes just like men had to pay taxes. I don't really see that as an example of patriarchal oppression, but they clearly felt it was. Then it goes on, he has monopolized nearly all the profitable employments and from those she is permitted to follow, she receives but a scanty remuneration. Well, this is not true. It is true that there was not equal pay for equal work. So for instance, one of the, um, quali uh, one of the um, professions that Stanton was quite exercised about was the fact that a woman who taught as her profession, a school teacher, was paid less than a man who taught, who did the same work. All of that changed, of course, and has been changed for 50 years in the early 1960s when laws were brought in, making it illegal to pay people uh, you know, mm -hmm. different amounts based on sex, even though we still continue to hear about how women are paid less, allegedly, for the same work, which is not true. But anyway, here it was, it was true. And again, it's a complicated issue in that um, it was understood that the man was earning money in order to support his family or to prepare himself to support his family. So there was an understanding that, you know, his, again, his financial burden was mm -hmm. different from that of the woman who was making money to support herself, perhaps while she was single, um, I'm not sure whether all states allowed married women to continue to teach. In some cases, they weren't allowed to keep on, but in some cases they were. So they might have been making extra money to support their families. So, you know, the understanding was that the man bore the financial burden and therefore he deserved to be paid more. Uh, I think that was wrong, but it wasn't done, be, you know, it wasn't done out of a sense that women were worth less as human beings. It wasn't done out of a sense that women didn't do a good job at things. It was done out of a practical understanding that the family was the bedrock of society and that men earning money to support their wives and children should be the, you know, sort of the central focus. So, you yes. know, again, it's, it's one of those it's one of those complicated issues that looks simple and looks clearly outrageously discriminatory from our present perspective, but was not quite that clear. And there was even, um, I'd like to know more about this, but there was a case where Stanton and, and I think her, her friend, Susan B. Anthony, went to a conference of uh, women teachers mm -hmm. and they were trying to have a resolution passed for equal pay. And interestingly enough, the teachers voted against it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why. Um, it might have been because they would have felt it made them less employable. Like if they, if they could be paid less, in some ways that would make them more attractive to a school board, you know, with limited funds looking to hire teachers. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it was because some of them wanted to marry teachers 
or were married to male teachers and they believed in the idea of the man being paid more. It's, it's yeah. not clear why I'd have to get into the documents about uh, what was discussed at the meeting, but Stanton was so furious that she wrote to a friend that she, she looked forward to the day when this generation of women died out hmm. Because, you know, she was just so angry that they had da dared to vote against this resolution. So even back then, uh, you know, women didn't necessarily see, th see things through our eyes. And they had their own rationales for supporting the status quo in, in some ways. And obviously not feeling that that was uh, just flat out discriminatory. And then just a couple last ones. Um, he closes against her all the avenues to wealth and distinction, which he considers most honorable to himself as a teacher of theology, medicine, or law. She is not known. Okay, well, um, to some extent, that's true. Um, women could not um, go into the spheres of theology, medicine, or law. They could by the end of the 19th century, but they couldn't in 1848. But it's not, it's not the case that all spheres of um, work and endeavor were closed. There were many women business owners, many women worked in the trades, um, women became wealthy as, um, as writers um, on, on nonfiction as well as fiction subjects, women were educators, they wrote about education, um, they made names for themselves as, as poets, as novelists, um, and in some cases made a great deal of money. So, you know, it, it wasn't that um, women were absolutely excluded from the sphere of um, money-making or professional endeavor. And as the century went on, they would be um, admitted to, to all of the major professions. Now, well, her dad was one. a lawyer. Her dad was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. her she, dad won, was, she couldn't become a lawyer. She couldn't become a lawyer and, and that so, rankled. Yeah. It you know, I think did. a lot of, it, it just seems to me a lot of this came from when she was 10 years old mm -hmm. and yeah. her brother was killed and, uh, you know, he was 10 years older than her, 11 years older than yeah. her. He would have mm -hmm. been a very pivotal part of her life, mm -hmm. I imagine. Yeah. He could have been a little bit more like her father because he would have been old enough to be caring for her. And then, she, and then she lost him. And who knows how her mother reacted to all of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, like where, where, where was her uh, allegiance and, and was she uh, in support of her husband? in that time and mm -hmm. you know so all of these things yeah. we don't know all of this stuff so mm -hmm. we just don't know but you're right i think that that you know that deep sense of of bitter grievance implanted yeah. at a very early age is clearly yes. coming out here uh, yeah. you know as an adult when she's writing about these her, her sense so. of anger and and uh, sense of the injustice last one i want to mention um well there's two two final statements he has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education, all colleges being closed against her. Now that one is actually a whopper. Um, it's just not true. And, and she knew it wasn't true. Uh, for one thing, as I said, she herself attended the Troy Seminary, which is a highly respected elite educational institution designed to give women the same educational opportunities as men. Now, maybe it wasn't. And so college. that was after high school. That was a college? Yes, it was, it was after, after high, high school. school. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so she went to that and uh, lots of women did. And, but it isn't true that even, I, mean, I, I was thinking, well, maybe that wasn't a college, but there were mm -hmm. colleges that had, there were colleges specifically founded to educate women in the early 19th century. There were famous colleges originally founded to educate men that opened their doors to women before she wrote this document. And she would have known this. One of her closest friends in the women's movement, Lucy Stone, went to Oberlin College which opened mm -hmm. to women in 1835. So that's right. a whole 13 huh. years before she wrote this document. And I read somewhere that between 1835 and 1875, 50 elite U.S. colleges opened their doors to oh, women. Yeah. <laughs> right. so, um, so it simply was not true. And 
anyway, yeah, it's astounding. The, the idea, and, and I've been told this, if I had a dollar for every time an angry person on Twitter or elsewhere tells me that I owe my education to feminism, I'd be a very wealthy woman. And it simply is not true. The implication that men wanted women to be stupid and wanted to keep them um, you know, ignorant, it is not true. Men wanted companions who were smart and well-educated. In many cases, women joined their husbands in running their husbands' businesses. Yes. Sometimes they continued to run those businesses when their uh, husbands became ill or after they died. Um, you know, the household economy was extremely complex. Men wanted women who had a good head on their shoulders and, and uh, you know, knew how to work out a budget and all of that. They want, it was, if you were upper middle class or higher, it was considered essential that a woman be able to converse well uh, at table and in society and that she should know, you know, have a thorough grounding in the arts and sciences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and also um, because the United States was a very religious society, you know, it was believed that it was necessary that women be, um, you know, very well educated so that they could read and understand the Bible. They could teach it to their children. They could teach mm -hmm. other matters of morality and ethics and society to their children because it was recognized that, of course, mothers were their children's first and in some ways best teachers. So for all those reasons, there was never any interest in the United States in keeping women ignorant. And it is such a, such a calumny on the men of the past to imagine that, that they were like they are being represented in, in a document like this. And, and it is sad to me that so many people accept men and women today, accept that that was the reality of the past, that there was this horrible, grim, doer, woman hating, patriarchal superstructure that just wanted to oppress women and make their lives miserable. And, and much of that, uh, you know, is expressed here in this document. And then it even ends, this is, I think, the last supporting point. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. So oh that's, goodness. I mean, you know, that, and it just, <laughs> this was not true of her upbringing. It was not true of the upbringing right. of many women. I mean, and she, she was a privileged woman. She had opportunities, even if she hadn't become the activist that she became, she had opportunities that many poor men living in the United States could only have dreamed about that the vast, vast majority of men could never access. And yet yeah. there is Oof. that anger. Wow. Wow, that's that's one wicked document. It really is. <laughs> it really is. It's just it is astounding, and you know, and I uh, again, I really think that that you know that the anger that she had, everything in her life was filtered through that, and it prevented her from seeing the reality of life in so many aspects. Um, she was very angry after the Civil War, uh, which of course was in the early eighteen sixties. I think eighteen sixty one to sixty five. She was very angry after the Civil War ended. She thought that that would be the time that a franchise would be extended to women. And instead, the um, Reconstruction effort led by the Republican Party focused on enfranchising the freed slaves, black men. She was furious that black men were going to get the franchise. Now, sometimes yeah. people have sometimes said this was as a result of her racism. I'm not sure about that. I think um, that may be a bit unfair. She was still um, very much opposed to any subordinate position for black people in the United States. Um, she wanted black men to be enfranchised, but she wanted black women and white women, especially to also be enfranchised. And I think it was that yeah. she, you know, she had accepted this idea, like she had this, she had this sense that her victimization as a woman was so much worse than any other person's victimization that she could not hear the arguments that were being made, even by many of her own friends in the women's suffrage movement, that in that the late 1860s, this was when um, 
the United States was, was passing the 14th Amendment, which gave full citizenship rights to uh, freed slaves, and the 15th Amendment, which eventually that was passed in 1870, and that did eventually give voting rights to black men, freed slaves. Mm -hmm. And um, she, like, she just, she could not accept. Uh, and her old friend, Frederick Douglass, the esteemed orator, who had spoken on behalf of women's suffrage at the Seneca Falls Convention, and a yeah. close friend of hers, he said to her, this is the hour of the black man. We need mm -hmm. this. And he even used that argument that, look, you have representation through your own men, the men in mm -hmm. your family. Black mm -hmm. women will have representation when black men are enfranchised. The, the reality mm -hmm. was that um, the Republican Party couldn't get support for woman suffrage. It could get support for the enfranchisement of black men. And so he said to Stanton, he argued with her, you know, th this is the time, allow this to pass and we will work together for women's enfranchisement. He'd already proved himself an ally in that struggle. And instead she just could not, she, she could not, she broke with everyone who was in favor of the 15th amendment. And there was actually a split in the women's movement, she founded her own, you know, separate society, and and I think it probably hurt the uh, suffrage cause because mm -hmm. it created so much bitterness and division. Mm -hmm. But she would rather have had that bitterness and division than give up her conviction that her, she was right and that her struggle was the most important struggle in yeah. the entire country. Yeah. <laughs> That's something, isn't it? Yeah. That she thinks that she is, that what she's thinking is the most important thing in the country. Man, you have to have one heck of a uh, self, a feeling of self importance mm -hmm. for for that to be the case. Yeah. No. No Oof. doubt. No hesitation. And even knowing what she knew about the like the literal danger that freed slaves were in in at that yeah. time. You know, there was mm -hmm. anger against them, uh, lynching, violence, their lives yeah. were And Frederick danger. Douglass, he had been, he was born a slave. He was, yeah, he was an He was born slave. a slave. He was educated by some kind masters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and ha was gifted. So he was Extremely. gifted and, yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, and so you'd think that she would be on her knees and listening to what he had to mm -hmm. say, but no. Yeah, nope. and, and they'd been nope. friends for decades, you know, huh. like they yeah. were close wow. personal friends. So, wow. yeah, it's huh. it's quite something. I mean, there, it, it, yeah, she she's a very interesting person in in that way, and and uh, obviously very intelligent. But I can't help but feel, um, and you know, and many people did say, I you know, I should give her credit. Many people liked her very much and said she was. Um, Mm -hmm. Like to me, she, when I read her words, I don't see this in her. And I even when mm -hmm. I look at her picture, I have to admit, I see a very angry woman. She's often staring at the camera. She mm -hmm. doesn't smile. Of course, people didn't smile as much then when they were having no. their pictures taken. But I, you know, to me, um, like I'd be frightened of her. I, I find her single mindedness and her fury and her deep sense of grievance quite off putting. But many people said she was a good speaker and her children spoke fondly of her, you know, so maybe oh, there good. was another side to her that, that we don't see in reading the documents that she produced. She did live a long life. Um, yeah. Um, although she got extremely obese in her, in her uh, latter years, she could hardly uh, move around, but, but she, oh. um, you know, lived a, a healthy, long life and, and many people loved her. So I have to give her that. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but certainly I, I have to say also that I find the, the intense anger and it's a lesson for me too, cause I'm often angry. So, um, you know, it, it, it is, I find it really off putting and, uh, destroys whatever for me, whatever good she did. Yes. Um, and maybe we should move and look briefly at the, the woman's Bible because that's, uh, yes, I think we should look briefly at it. Certainly it, it's, I mean, this is a later life work of hers it was published in parts um starting in 1895 so she was quite elderly by then she was born in 1815 so 1895 so you know she was up there in age and um 
Still just as feisty, you know, though. Yeah, she was feisty. Yeah, she, <laughs> and so she would have been eighty, right? And uh, yeah, she and she wrote this. It's mainly her. Uh, it was written with a committee, but there are very few um, commentaries by anyone other than her. And, yes. Um, yes, it's a it's an angry document about the Bible. It is <laughs> in which she makes clear that she had no respect for the Bible. As, she did not see it as no. the word of God. I, I think she was a deist. I think is the correct term, meaning that she she believed in a in a supreme being, but she felt that that supreme being was not um, revealed in, uh, you know, through the, 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 the record of the Bible. She did not see the Bible as divinely inspired in any way. In fact, she says that, you know, over and over again. She's, and it says quite contemptuously in, at moments, do you think the supreme being spoke to these Jews in this manner? I don't think so. I think the <laughs> patriarchs just made this stuff up for their own purposes so they could real rule over their women folk. And, and, you know, yeah. so it's very long. I mean, it's, it's, it's very long to think of somebody spending so much time and there were parts that were interesting, but, uh, and I'm always interested in biblical exegesis, like anyone who can illuminate those texts, I find that fascinating. And in a few cases, I thought she had interesting things to say about you know, some of the stories in the Old Testament. But, but you know, generally, it is just a single-minded, angry, bitter <laughs> um, assertion that everything in the Bible is a statement of man, male supremacy. And, you know, she's angry over some really quite astounding things. At one point, she talks about how Pharaoh, um, you know, made it a, a, a law that the firstborn, no, not the firstborn, but that all male babies should be killed because he was worried mm -hmm. about their threat to him. She even expresses anger at that, saying, you know, this is just typical of this patriarchal society that women weren't considered, you know, girl babies weren't considered to be important <laughs> to the, yeah, so they weren't killed. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very strange yes. um, source of grievance. And, and that's really it. Every time you get a male lineage, she's irritated that the, the names of the uh, wives, you know, of, of, certain families weren't named um it's just all this anger there's this one story you know that story of um balaam's ass uh which is the story it's a really weird story i think it's outside of the speaking serpent it's the only case in the bible someone might correct me if i'm wrong where a, an animal is made to speak and it's this really mm. odd story about um the Israelites were coming into the kingdom of Moab and the king of Moab told Balaam that he should go and curse the Israelites. And the end of the story is that, that um, Balaam does go to curse the Israelites, but when he opens his mouth to speak his curses, blessings come out instead. So it's an amazing story. Um, but it, it, before that, he gets on his donkey and he starts going to where he has to go and an angel of the Lord appears, but only to the donkey. The donkey sees the angel of the Lord and Balaam doesn't. So the donkey kind of shies away and Balaam's really annoyed that the donkey isn't going in the way he's supposed to. And or actually it's a she as we'll come to this in a minute. And then at another point the, the donkey actually collapses rather than walk into the angel of the Lord and Balaam starts beating the donkey and then the donkey is given voice. And so the donkey speaks to Balaam saying, what are you doing to me? What have I done to deserve to be beaten? And Balaam says, well, you're not, mm -hmm. you're not going where I, you know, I want you to go. You're humiliating me. And then the angel of the Lord appears to Balaam and he realizes that he's been unjust to the donkey and he apologizes. I'm not sure if he apologizes to the donkey or to the angel of the Lord or both and says, okay, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go on. And anyway, it's a very weird story to me. And I have never read any commentary about its significance, but um, Stanton focuses on it and says the only thing of interest in the story is that the donkey was a female donkey. <laughs> yeah, that would sounds right. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's it. No interest it. in why God has the donkey speak. No interest in whether it can be read allegorically. Um, you know, like just that, you know, and it's that single mindedness. Every single thing gets filtered through that tiny, aggrieved, lens of hers and that's the only thing that matters it's and she picks and chooses occasionally there'll be a powerful woman or a good woman mentioned that she said aha this is good here's a here's a woman that is active and virtuous so that's good but every other time there isn't a, a virtuous woman it's just an example of patriarchal bigotry and <laughs> so yeah it's uh uh quite something it's quite something it's quite something and I was reading, I think it was Exodus 16, says the seventh day Sabbath was, was chiefly for men. Oh, yes. Impossible to have a day of rest for women. And so, you know, every everything yeah. was in, she compared everything that was said was in comparison to women. Yeah. And and she found lacking. Yeah. 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 She, so she, she, she would describe the Bible as a document that was lacking, uh, Credibility, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just uh, unbelievable uh, pride, yeah. unbelievable pride. I know her, her wow. anger, her anger at the, like, I think she hated all religions really. Um, but, but specifically Christianity, because that would be totally the one cruel. that she knew the best. And, and, you know, it, it, and it's another example of her intransigence in that uh, many of the women involved in the women's movement were quite religious, including mm -hmm. Susan B. Anthony, her closest friend and, and mm -hmm. um, ally. Um, many of them were, were Quakers. They were from dissenting religions, but some from mainline churches as well. And many begged her not to publish this book. They said this is going mm -hmm. to, you know, at best, it's going to um, associate our cause of women's rights and suffrage with uh, your anger at Christianity. And that's not going to yeah. do us any good. And right. at worst, it, it, it actually could like seriously harm the cause and cause dissension and, you know, needless bitterness and hurt and, and you know, everything else. Mm -hmm. And she just, she couldn't stop. She went ahead. Uh, there were various conventions at which people moved that, um, you know, the, 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 this particular chapter of the suffrage mm -hmm. association she had found, they moved that they, they wanted to distance themselves from her attacks on the Bible and on Christianity. Yeah. It wouldn't stop her. You know, she just she had that, wow. that deep anger and conviction of her own um, singular righteousness. And it, it mm -hmm. just, it wouldn't allow her. And even like really basic things, uh, like the thing I found most striking in, in her commentary on the Bible is comes right near the beginning when she's describing the fall of, you know, the fall in the garden, fall of Adam and Eve. And, and uh, she, she says that Eve's decision to disobey God's law and mm -hmm. to eat of the forbidden fruit and to listen to the serpent when the serpent told her that she would be as a God, mm -hmm. that that was a good model for women Oh yeah, that's the. It's. I think it's the view we have now. It is exactly like I. You know, I thought, it, wow. There's nothing new in the history of feminism. It's all <laughs> right there in Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and she says, yeah. "Oh, this was a really good thing. It shows that this woman wanted knowledge and power, and we should admire yeah, no her doubt. and praise her for wanting knowledge. Like she takes it completely out of the evident context." of the story and what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be a warning, obviously, against hubris and pride and, and the, the idea that as a human being, we can attain to Godhead. That's very, very clear. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really good warning. And she, she turns it into a, uh, the opposite. It's an injunction to women to believe in themselves and to believe themselves potentially on the level of Godhead and that everything they will to do and desire to do, they should do. Yeah. You know, Jonathan Pajot, uh, he explains the p patterns of the Bible. I've listened to him quite a bit. And when he talks about actually his brother, Matthew, he's written a document on the Bible too. And he said that uh, Eve biting the apple, 
She bit off more than she could chew. She's incorporating the poison of, because this is, because he's told not to eat of this fruit that makes it, and a serpent tells her to that's, and because a serpent is something that's also poisonous. So she's trying to incorporate poisonous and she's uh, willing to take in the distant, the fringes of society, you know, the things that are uh, not accepted to and, and and women are looking to the the uh, the the disenfranchised and the children and we are supposed to be taking care but we're not supposed to be bringing everything in and accepting everything and she wanted Eve wanted to bring in everything and then Adam said yeah let's do it what happened to those two you know, kicked out of the garden. That's what happened to them. Kicked out of the garden and deemed to suffer for the rest of their lives. And we're doing that now. It's the same, it's the same story. It's the same story. It's just come. And people say, oh, the first wave of feminism was different from the mm -hmm. second wave. And the third wave, of the, the you know, this one, oh, it's way different mm -hmm. than the first wave. And I'm starting to think, I don't know if there's a big difference between it all. It looks like it all came right from the beginning. Yeah, that's that's certainly my um, my my sense of it is that um, you know, and sometimes people will say to me challengingly, you know, was there no um, like was was there nothing in the nineteenth century situation of women that deserved to have a movement? You know, were there no issues right. and. And and that's not really the issue for me. I, I would say yes, of course, there is always a time for um, attention to women's issues and attention to men's mm -hmm. issues, especially mm -hmm. if the attention to them is is uh, the type of attention that helps men and women work together to yes make a better society. And um, but the the problem is that the movement was always. It was always so angry. The anti-male animus built into its founding principles is just, um, it's undeniable. And, you know, and it also, like, reading about Stanton, as we said, she had a privileged life. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure she had her sorrows, as you pointed out with her, the death of her brother and and who knows about the family dynamics and all of that. But right. overall, she she had a very, very good upbringing. She was beloved in that family. She was given freedom. She was well-educated. She was well-looked after. She was loved. She, was, she turned right. into a self-confident, maybe too confident young woman mm -hmm. who married a man who supported her in all of these endeavors and, and never objected or never used his alleged patriarchal power to limit her freedoms or anything mm -hmm. like that. And yet there she is believing herself uniquely victimized as a woman and I and that's the lesson that I take out of her story and so many other stories is that um that like that's such a dangerous thing that that victimhood ideology because what yeah. it does is it not only makes you see everything through the lens of your victimhood so that you're unable to see anything else but it really leeches away your empathy for other people you you stop being able to really to see the humanity in other people or to recognize mm -hmm. that they too suffer. Once you pin them as oppressors or at least as antagonists, as those who are not supporting your cause, you no longer can see them as fully human. And it's so mm -hmm. dangerous. And narrow, it's a very it, narrow it's viewpoint. It's incredible, it really is. And, and I think mm -hmm. she's a good example also of, um, like often I will hear people say, um, when they try to understand where the hatred comes in, from like some modern mm -hmm. feminists, there's a, mm -hmm. you know, the Egyptian American feminist Mona El Tahawi, who a few years ago wrote a book called The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls, which advocates that women and girls do terrible things, that they engage in violence, mm -hmm. that they be proud, that they embrace their anger. And it's a recipe mm -hmm. for um, deeply unhappy and dysfunctional female lives. And mm -hmm. she's actually called publicly for violence, preemptive, as she calls it, wow. violence against patriarchal men. So uh, she's quite reprehensible. And, and you know, like a lot of men 
struggle to understand where does all that come from? Like, where does that anger? And they think that it's, she must have had the, you know, bad experiences as, as a young person, which, you know, she may have, I don't know. Um, but I also think that that's no excuse though, either. Well, it's certainly you can not have an bad excuse. experiences and learn from them. No, sure. Absolutely. A, men, men have many bad experiences sometimes <laughs> at the hands yeah. of their mothers. Uh, often boys right. are abused. Um, I think many boys today have mothers who, who hate their masculinity and mm -hmm. uh, Seems that do way. all sorts mm -hmm. of horrible things to their boys, both physically and psychologically. And that doesn't give anybody an excuse to be violent or abusive. No, but but it also made me think that, like, we often think the experience shapes the ideology, and it's because mm -hmm. you had these bad experiences that you then adopted an ideology that was full of hate. But I actually think sometimes it's the other way around too, or at least that both work together. That the ideology shapes the experience. So you adopt this ideology and, and, and um, uh, Stanton got it from her abolitionist friends and she got it from uh, peers and probably even women she met at the Troy Seminary. And she passed it on to Susan B. Anthony, who was not a women's rights activist when she met Stanton. She was interested in, in the temperance movement, other social reform movements. So I think mm -hmm. also the ideology then transforms your experience so that you're not able to actually experience reality as reality. You experience it through the, the filter that your ideology provides. And so that's why ideologies are so just um, so important to understand and, and, and to oppose. Recognize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to be able to mm -hmm. argue against. Well, I've read that uh, one ideological class if a person takes one ideological class that they are, and then so say they write a paper and then they're given, then they they attend this ideological class that, that, that turns their viewpoint around and then they write another paper, their viewpoint will be changed around just because they attended the class. Yeah. So it, it's yeah. pretty, that's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's um, scary. Yeah, it's, it is. That's it, scary. It, it, yeah. I find it, you know, when I, and again, too, when, when uh, sometimes people will say, well, second wave feminism wasn't so bad. Right. Uh, right. It was just about women wanting uh, an end of sexist stereotyping and they wanted to be able to pursue professions. It's not true. Uh, I've looked at uh, the founding um, course outlines of women's studies courses that were taught in the early 1970s. So that we're talking 50 years ago and they were mm -hmm. just as bad as you could possibly imagine. They were, Is that right? oh, they were hmm. anti-male, they promoted lesbianism, they were anti-white, they were anti-capitalist, they made vast generalizations about patriarchal oppression. They said that rape was something that all men benefited by, for, from, sorry. Mm -hmm. Rape was something all men benefited from um, because mm -hmm. some men raped and that meant that all women lived in fear of men and men enjoy having that kind of dominance over women. It's all sorts of just horrible, hateful, anti-male propaganda. So that has been in the universities that spread you know, there was no opposition to the establishment of women's studies courses and programs It spread throughout the all of North America mm -hmm. in a very short time. So we've had yes. 40 years at least. That's mm -hmm. really what two generations uh, of young people, hundreds of thousands being indoctrinated by um, an ideology that's not even based in reality. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very worrisome. Yes, well, the spirit of resentment yeah. it cause it'll it'll cause it'll cause the demise of of our of our universities. It already is yeah. beca causing the demise of the universities, but now it's spreading to HR through all yes. the companies, mm -hmm. and so now yeah. that so that now that's the business and yeah. into the government mm -hmm. and, everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Everywhere. So we yeah we have to talk about this. So who are we going to talk? about next. Yeah, who are we going to talk about next? I think maybe we should move over the across the Atlantic and look at okay. the suffragettes because they're a very interesting in Britain. In Britain yes. All right. Maybe let's we do could it. look at Emmeline Pankhurst who was the leader. Oh yeah, I've read the, about uh, her. She's, yeah. She's yeah. fascinating. So let's see. She do her is, next. yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds really good. Thank you so much. Well, thank Janice. you. I really enjoyed to that. See you. Lovely to Good. talk to you. I'm glad. I'm so glad. This is uh, 
I think this is such an important thing to do. And people are commenting. I have such good comments from people thanking you for uh, sharing everything that you know. Um, and it, it all has to come out. We have to talk about it. And uh, I have to be educated in it. And I'm sure lots of other people do. So I'm very grateful to you. Thank you so well, much. I'm grateful that I get the chance to talk to you. So thank you. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. It works for both of us. Then. Yeah. <laughs>